President Obama unveils his strategy for dealing with the savagery of Islamic extremists, but no ground troops for now. A review board has found sheriff's deputies were negligent and lied about the 2012 death of a county jail inmate. Does anyone in authority care? And a shocking video brings professional sports off-field violence into sharp focus. I'm Mark Sauer, and the KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome. It's Friday, September 12th. I'm Mark Sauer. And joining me at the KPBS Roundtable today are reporter Kelly Davis of San Diego City Beat, Tony, Bear, Tony Perry, excuse me, San Diego Bureau Chief for the Los Angeles Times, and sports reporter Brent Scrotenmore of USA Today. Well, reports of savagery, including the beheadings of two American journalists by the Islamic terror group ISIS, have inflamed public opinion. Pressure mounted on President Obama to again expand military action in Iraq. He presented his plan in, the, in a clear and concise, uh, concisely pointed address to the nation on Wednesday night. So, Tony Perry, first question here. Uh, San Diego troops, Marines going back in, boots on the ground? Does not appear so. He seems to have ruled that out. Uh, there will be, I believe, some Marines there. They know Iraq pretty doggone well. And one of the things that the president wants is to get the Sunni tribes back into the fold, have them form what are now being called the National Guard and join the fight. Marines know a lot about that area and they know a lot of the uh, tribal sheikhs. So they will be there, small numbers, I believe. We got 1,600 folks there now, though, uh, the president noted the other Indeed, night. most of them uh, either uh, devising plans and information reports for the commander in chief or uh, supporting, protecting uh, the, uh, uh, the embassy there in the green zone. Uh, the folks from San Diego who are going to be there are Navy. I mean, the carrier of Vincent is uh, in, the, uh, in the area now. It's in Japan, India, ocean, that kind of area. It could easily move in to the uh, Persian Gulf and take over the airstrike mission from uh, the, the carrier Bush. So, so far, in terms of San Diego, this is going to be a Navy show, not Marines, according to the Commander-in-Chief. And he, Obama is, has not been enthusiastic about going back in. He's, no. he's made that pretty clear. He hasn't been very enthusiastic about expanding it in any way. No, and, and his critics point out that uh, he defines his military views based on what he won't do. Mm -hmm. Even when he expanded the uh, number of troops in Afghanistan several years ago, he added, and we're going to have them all out by a certain date. He's uh, always uh, been distrustful of the Iraq mission, didn't think it was uh, worth it. The dumb war. As he said, and ran in 2008 on the idea that I will bring an end to that war and trumpeted the fact uh, that he had done so. Uh, now we're back in, but not all the way back in. But we, he, this is a war he inherited from his uh, predecessor and that it looks like he will pass on to his successor. Mm -hmm. uh, every president since what? Since Jerry Ford? Every president since Jerry Ford has found himself in the thicket that is the Middle East. Well, whoever succeeds in replacing a succeeding uh, Barack Obama we'll still be is going to be is yeah. going to have to make all those those horrid decisions. All right, we uh, the president was talking about ISIS and explained why there's a threat. Let's uh, let's hear this uh, bite. So ISIL poses a threat to the people of Iraq and Syria and the broader Middle East, including American citizens, personnel, and facilities. If le left unchecked, these terrorists could pose a growing threat beyond that region, including to the United States. All right, so he's saying it could be a threat to the U.S. Right now it's a big threat in the region. And he's trying to build this coalition because these folks are so savage. There's a bunch of enemies over there. They're going after Muslims first. Uh, and, and really, the, the Western threat and threat in the U.S. Is, is an afterthought, it would appear, at this point. Uh, they've done brutal things uh, to the Christians, uh, to, their, uh, to the uh, Shia uh, Islams, to uh, these smaller religious groups, of which there are a bunch, uh, the Turkmen, uh, the, the, the Yazadis uh, that they had encircled. These are savage people. Now, how strong they are as a fighting force is very hard to uh, determine. Uh, we don't really have a lot of on-the-ground newspaper journalism reporting about it. Hard to assess. They're very good at these scary, brutal videos, but people are cautioning don't be spooked by these videos. As, as dreadful as they are, they don't necessarily mean, and this is a first-rate fighting force. Now, 
when they took over those parts of Anbar, Ramadi um, and, and uh, Fallujah, Al Qaim, uh, the the Iraqi government threw down its guns and ran away. I mean, they, the Iraqi forces, incompetent, cowardly leadership. Uh, now, are all the Iraqi battalions that cowardly? Uh, we hope not. We hope not. And that's what the uh, U.S. has been trying to do, get that army that we spent, what, $8 billion in a decade putting together, try to get it back together. Now, can you put Humpty Dumpty back together? I don't know. Let's talk about the media aspect for a second. I want to draw the rest of the panel in on this. Um, we had those videos. They were shocking the beheading of the two American journalists there. Um, you know, and the uh, ostensibly the uh, the uh, terrorists said we're going to uh, intimidate America with these. Well, we obviously weren't intimidated after 9/11. We went in and occupied and invaded two countries here. But the point, it seems to me, and a lot of critics have made this point, as Tony alluded to, is that they had a, a purpose with that. They they want to get the Americans back involved and get the uh, the heat off of them from the other Muslims and make us a target again. I mean, what was your impression in terms of how media savvy they were with those? Problems? I think very media savvy, and I think one of the themes of this show here is the power of video. I have to wonder if the, the video of the beheadings didn't happen as the president go on primetime television and make a case to the American public because I think the American public is very impacted by it and I think the the public opinion went toward favored inter intervention with, after those videos happened. Images are so powerful, although they can be terribly misleading. Uh, in the first battle in Fallujah in April of 2004, there was uh, suddenly CNN coverage of some bombing. Bombing had been going on, but CNN hadn't been there. Right. And the president and Tony Blair, the prime minister of England, saw it on TV and called for a halt on the assault. Changed everything. Uh, and and the, uh, the Marines from Camp Pendleton had, were ordered to pull out had to go back in six months later, much right. bloodier. I want to hear from President Obama again. This time he's talking about the importance of building this coalition over there with us. But this is not our fight alone. American power can make a decisive difference, but we cannot do for Iraqis what they must do for themselves. Nor can we take the place of Arab partners in securing their region. And that's why I've insisted that additional U.S. action depended upon Iraqis forming an inclusive government which they have now done in recent days. So tonight, with a new Iraqi government in place and following consultations with allies abroad and Congress at home, I can announce that America will lead a broad coalition to roll back this terrorist threat. His choices are few, uh, none of them good. No, Iraq is going to be very difficult to roll back the advances uh, ISIS has made uh, Syria is going to be 10 times, 100 times, if you will, worse, even with the uh, enormous air, air power we have. Coalition warfare, the people who study these sorts of things will tell you, is the most difficult of warfares. Even in the, the good war, World War II, all sorts of disputes between America, England, France, and of course Stalin. Uh, and so now we have all sorts of cultural, religious issues, and it's going to be like herding cats. Uh, but, and, but, and, and they're the cats. They're the cats they're the that cats. are living there. And in theory, they have a lot of skin in the game. The Jordanians are being flooded by refugees from Syria. The, uh, the Saudis, they, they're worried about their own uh, situation. They're a gerontocracy. The Iranians, of course, who we don't speak to, they've got real skin in the game. Oh, absolutely. In theory, they've all got reasons to help, hmm. whether they will or whether they will do a little bit, but require us to do most of the fighting, first with air power, and if it comes to that uh, boots on the ground, remains to be seen. Well, we'll see, and it's, we're going to have to watch this closely and for a long time, I'm afraid. All right, we're going to shift to another segment here. It's a terrible story. A 28-year-old black man is taken to San Diego County Jail for violating probation on a drug wrap. Uh, deputies know he swallowed a baggie of meth before being booked, yet he dies from an overdose days later in solitary confinement. Bernard Victor Ains' death is just one of 60 in San Diego County jails since 2007. And Kelly, fill us in here. Give us the high points of this particular case with Bernard. Uh, really quick, it's actually 60 was uh, uh, City Beat. We've been uh, reporting on jail deaths, and 60 was the number between 2007 and 2012. Okay. It's since grown. Let me see if I can do the math real quick in my head. Um, 60, 72, uh, it's up to 83. There have been. In those last two years. There were 12 deaths in 2013. Uh -huh. 
there have been 11 so far in uh, 2014 uh, okay. that, that I know of. All right. So. And give us the high points of this particular case that the uh, Citizen Review Board, we'll get to in a minute, was uh, was so disturbed by. Yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah, but, uh, Bernard Victorian, um, like you, you said, he had a, a kind of a long rap sheet of, of drug offenses. He was pulled over in City Heights for a, a DUI, and uh, it was observed swallowing a baggie of meth. And uh, they took him to the hospital, um, didn't keep him too long, booked him in jail. And then over the next uh, seven days, five days, I think, uh, he slowly been, he slowly started exhibiting signs of, of meth intoxication. Um, bizarre behavior, screaming that his insides were burning. And instead of putting him in a uh, medical observation unit, they decided to put him into solitary confinement and give him some anti-psychosis uh, 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 medication, Haldol, some Ativan, I guess, to calm him down. And uh, the day before he died, uh, uh, a sheriff's deputy kind of uh, falsified a, a check, said he checked on him, didn't really check on him. The next morning, he was found uh, face down, naked in a cell. Uh, two sheriff's deputies did enter his cell, uh, kind of looked at him for uh, 41 seconds, according to surveillance video, uh, said his name. He gave no response, uh, no, no sign that he was conscious or that he could hear them. Uh, they walked out of his cell, left him there. Uh, there was a shift change, and three hours later when they, they found him, um, he but had been dead for... for uh, a, a period of time that um, rigor mortis, rigor mortis had, set, had yeah. set in. So, so he'd been dead for a while. Yeah. The, uh, the the group CLURB and the, the cumbersome name Citizens Law Enforcement Rebo Review Board, mm -hmm. their findings uh, were pretty harsh for, for a board that really uh, doesn't come up with such they, findings. Tell us about I've that in looked, this case. Yeah, I, we, I've looked back at, at all of their findings on jail deaths uh, since 2007. This was by far the most extensive. Usually they'll have a, a little paragraph and usually they'll say, you know, everything was fine, or we don't have enough information to reach a conclusion. But this not one this time. was, uh, I think, seven or eight uh, point findings and very strongly worded. So this is uh, something something new. This is a, a new club that we're, we're seeing. Here. And they recommend a summary dismissal of a jail employee. Um, and oh, that was um, no, that was a, a terminology for uh, for one of the findings. They. They can make. They recommended. Uh, they ultimately recommended uh, some policy changes, but they can't force the sheriff's department to do anything. The sheriff's department says that, based on their own review, they have made some policy changes. Changes about how someone screened for drugs and um, how often uh, inmate welfare checks are yeah. to be Tony? conducted. Well, well, help me out on this. Okay, he, he's picked up for drunk driving. The beat cop thinks he has swallowed something. They take him to Alvarado. He denies it, by the way. That, that, and that happens. <laughs> they all the they time, take yeah. him to Alvarado. They do an x-ray on him. They can't find it. It's not there. They take him to jail. He's still denying it. Mm -hmm. They look in his med record. He's an alcoholic. He's a drug user. He is mentally ill. He's still denying he swallowed anything. Mm -hmm. Starts and they, they're, they give him some medication, antipsychotic. Mm -hmm. He starts to act out. He starts to yell, "I'm on fire! I'm on fire!" The kind of things that a non-doctor might say. Gee, that seems like the rantings of someone who's psychotic. He never says, as I understand it, "Hey, I swallowed a, a bag of, of meth." If he had said that at any time, except when he was in the absolute final moments, wouldn't they have grabbed him, taken him out, and he'd be alive today if he had? If he had identified well, that, well, we don't we don't know for sure that he never that that's what the sheriff's department is saying. Um, he he's, he was seen by medical staff three times. Uh, a lawsuit was filed today uh, on behalf of his family. So, so maybe when when those medical records are released, we might see something different. But this is not unusual. Inmates will never admit to swallowing. Well, I don't want to say never, but I've come across this before where they just won't admit to it because they think it'll increase their. But even their the fr isn't the phrase "I'm on fire"? I'm on fire. <laughs> the kind of thing someone who is psychotic might say, and so a deputy, not trained in medical uh, 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 terminology, might say he's psychotic. He was in a what a, a single cell mm -hmm. to keep him away from other people, mm -hmm. to keep him from being hurt by other people, and he's acting like a psychotic. And they made a wrong determination. This isn't unusual, though. This I, I've come across a lot of cases um, outside of San Diego where this is what happens. Um, it, it, they did, it, as the as the uh, methamphetamine increases in their system, they display these signs of psychosis. So, and I'm sure the jails have seen this before. Um, 
Well, and, and the other question is, with this many deaths, and, and he's unresponsive and face down, at that point I'm thinking, I'm not a doctor, I'm a, a jailer, I'm a deputy. Let's get yeah, him over to the medical unit and get him evaluated in, just in an abundance of caution. Yeah, that's, that's... What about these new scanners? Uh, apparently they put them in at all the jails, the same ones that take nude pictures of you at Lindbergh <laughs> Field. Uh, do you th they did that in response to this case and, and other cases yeah. and your, your hard-nosed reporting. Do you think they're going to help? Will they catch the next guy who's swallowed a baggie of meth and, and won't self-identify. The, the jails have a new uh, chief medical officer, uh, um, Dr. Alfred Joshua, who has instituted a lot of pretty impressive changes, and I, I think he was kind of driving force behind this one, so I, I, I think this is great. Um, I, I, although now, now I have a question is, you know, does the inmate need to consent? to being screened, so I, I'm going to find that out. Because yeah, call the ACLU, they'll tell yeah. you their view on it. Yeah, yeah it's, <laughs> I would imagine not. I mean, they they don't have to consent to taking their clothes off and, and having right. their anus checked. DNA <laughs> tests and all yeah, that. So I Let me ask doubt you, that. Uh, in the deaths and you're reporting here, how does that compare to elsewhere in Southern California, other county jails and all? San Diego's pretty bad. Um, we the measure that we use to determine the the mortality rate is the same measure that the uh, Department of Justice Bureau of Justice Statistics uses when they release I think every three to five years they release a report on deaths in in county jails so we use that same measure and according to that San Diego comes out uh, as the highest the highest uh, mortality rate the sheriff's taken some some um, issue with us using that that measure but but it's it's you know it's what the top researchers isn't it say. hard though to compare jail to jail i mean they don't all have the same uh, population that, that's in la county for right. example uh, and i would never hold their uh, their jail system up as a model but a lot of their prisoners have already been through several days in the city jail right. before they're sent over so they've been kind of vetted to see if they're going to commit suicide immediately if they swallowed a baggie and so they go over to uh the county jail the uh the house that OJ built, and uh, so they have a lower number because they've weeded out those that want to kill themselves immediately. So a little different process. That there. would be really hard to pin down that whole process and what impact it has. Um, of maybe there, but the the um, the reason why the Bureau of Justice Statistics uses the measure it uses is is so you can compare jails to jails. Um, you can compare, you know, across populations. Does anybody care at the Board of Supervisors? I mean, they, <laughs> the, the sheriff is elected. I understand mm -hmm. that. But and the have board, no, no one running against him. The, indeed. <laughs> uh, but the board uh, does his budget. Uh, yeah, I'd like to see a little reaction to this because um, the lawsuits are increasing exponentially. Uh, prior to uh, us starting to report on this stuff, we knew of two lawsuits. Right now, uh, I know of, I believe this will make the sixth or seventh lawsuit that has either been filed or is pending and so and and some of those lawsuits are going to look pretty bad for the now, jails. Last segment they did a review people. right they did an internal review that found that the guards did the check although it was kind of a drive-by right and we don't know what came out of that those guards may have paid a price with their careers or not we, uh, exactly yeah and because that's confidential but it went that. up to the sheriff so in theory unless he's somehow so smitten with these guards, my hunch would be if he found something wrong, he'd have, he took we a whack so. at them. And we'd like, yeah. to, we'd like to know that. You know? Well, good, luck, good luck getting that. <laughs> well, we're going to leave it there, and we will look for more stories you'll be doing on this, I'm sure. All right, by now, most everyone has seen or at least is aware of the disturbing video showing uh, pro football star Ray Rice knocking out his then fiance in an elevator in Atlantic City. That video has brought the NFL's long-standing problem of off-field violence into sharp relief. For Rice and his now wife, Janae, the video turned his original two-game suspension into the end of their livelihood as the team fired him and the NFL has banned him indefinitely. And Brent, for this uh, sports-crazed Americans, this triggered a uh, hot national debate this week, did it not? It did, because uh, it brought into question uh, the leadership of the National Football League. Roger Goodell, he makes $44 million a year, at least he did last year. Nice work if you can get it. <laughs> yeah, and the question is the old cliche, what did he know and when did he know it? Uh, uh, did he cover this up? And uh, they're they're having an investigation now to find out exactly when the league knew about it. Brought in the former head of the FBI, right, right Mr. Right. Mueller, to take a look. So we're that. gonna that pub that report is gonna be public, so we'll find out in due time. But 
I think it also brings into focus the issue of domestic violence and pro sports. Right, and this is not a new story. I mean, I, I, I think back to uh, all sorts of violent incidents, Ty Cobb <laughs> way right. back in the early of the last century, uh, Jim Brown, the football great in the 60s. This isn't something new. Uh, several cases here in San Diego, not just in football, but in, in baseball as well. Right. I, I've been tracking NFL arrests since January 2000. There have been 89 domestic violence incidents since January 2000. And a lot of those are dropped. They're thrown out of court because the alleged victim doesn't want to cooperate for various reasons. It's commonplace with these kinds of The situations. nature of domestic violence throughout society, not just in celebrities right. Right. sports figures. Yeah. And usually the most that would happen would be a one or two game suspension, which makes this case unusual. And what's unusual about it is there's video. There's, there wasn't video in any of these other cases. It, it sparked outrage, and then it gets into the echo chamber of social media, and the next thing you know, he's suspended indefinitely, and that the team has cut him. He was a pretty good player, too. So the thing is, it's, it's not unusual. It's not unusual, unfortunately, in professional sports. I don't think there's an epidemic going on in the NFL or any pro sports league. They're but, reflecting society. Right, exactly. And we've even seen issues here in San Diego with players. Not that many, but, you know, Brian Giles was a player for the Padres. In 2006, there was a video incident. He pleaded no contests, absolutely nothing happened. He was not suspended. The team didn't do anything. The team didn't, I'm not even sure the team knew about him for two years later when the woman sued him for palimony. Mm -hmm. So I saw that uh, Eric Tony. Metal of the Chargers uh, tweeted out that he feels ashamed to be part of the NFL because of this. Mm -hmm. um, is that the general feeling, do you think, of NFL players or is that across the board? Well, I think there's a lot of uh, kind of hidden animosity toward the commissioner. The commissioner is kind of a law and order guy. He's taken on the issue of player personal conduct. Um, he started it in 2007 when there's a rash of arrests, and he kind of has a reputation of not allowing enough due process, and that's kind of the line he has to toe is a due process versus appearing to be on top of these situations and being the sheriff in the NFL. Um, so I think the players are a little bit kind of maybe enjoying this secretly just to see uh, Roger Goodell squirm a little bit. But I don't know what's going to happen to him. I mean, it really, I'd be surprised if there's incriminating evidence. It, it, is the NFL we, hierarchy male only? It could, and could that have led to kind of a tone deafness of the seriousness of this? It, it could have been. Uh, the Associated Press report that the league was sent this video in April, apparently um, a woman in the league office received it and saw the video. We don't know who he it was. responded by voicemail. Right? Responded by voicemail. We don't know who that person is, but um, I, we'll find that out in the report. But I, I, I want to get back to that video in a moment, but I want to turn to uh, our woman on the panel, Kelly, about uh, just women in, in football. Um, you know, we've got the portrayal of... Uh, of it's, it's sex and violence, it sells a lot in our society, but you got the Charger girls, the Raider and Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders. Um, we've got, of course, beer commercials that are risque and all. Do you think there's a culture there of, of women objectified within kind of the everything going on around this sport and maybe it, uh, it tends to uh, blow this up when you get a d domestic violence situation? Well, it, it's, I mean, not just that, you're right, you know, the scantily clad cheerleaders and, and such, but also, um, uh, on my way over here uh, to the point was had a great discussion on this topic and uh, Steve Almond was on uh, talking about his latest book the title of which I'm not remembering but it, he was just talking about the culture of entitlement uh, that that these football players grow up in and he brought up uh, Steubenville Ohio where um, you know two player football players star football players raped a, a girl and at the high she, school level, at the high school no and and the town rallied around the football players and and the girl became an outcast and and that's happened in other cities as well so um i think it's yeah kind of too too bad you know the 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 misogyny and the uh the sense of entitlement um, kind of coming again. together. Let's get back to that video for a moment. Everything about this incident was described way back in the spring. It was in print. All the details were there. They, they knew what happened. There was an earlier video, not as dramatic as the one we're talking about. And, you know, he, he apologized to his fiance then married him, etc. In other words, all this was out there. But Marshall McLuhan said in the 20th century, the medium is the message. This video changed everything. Didn't really change the event or what we knew about it. But this video had that kind of power. Absolutely. We, we knew he hit his wife. We knew that he knocked her unconscious. And we was dragged out of the elevator. The previous video showed him 
dragging her out of the elevator. Yeah. Yeah. It's yes. like, so all of a sudden we see the video that shows actually what happened in the elevator and everybody's like, oh my God. And right. it's like, well, what did you think when you, you heard in February that he knocked out his and fiance? He, and he supposedly told Goodell yeah. that he, 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 he fessed up to Goodell. I hit her. He said he did. So it, it really just shows the power of video. It's like the emotional reaction that the public has. And I think a different part of the equation now, unlike a few years ago, is like Twitter and Facebook. It, it and just, TMZ. And TMZ, <laughs> who's, pay, who's paying for this kind of video. Sure. Um, and it really gets out there, and we're seeing more of this. All right, in the few seconds we have left, uh, uh, Janae Rice came out and said, you've re-victimized me and us here. You've taken away our livelihood. We, we paid a penalty earlier on. You know, is, is there a fair point there? I don't know. I mean, it, she's a little bit, I think, blaming the messenger on this with the media. I mean, it's common. Uh, it's not surprising she would have that kind of reaction. The, the alleged victims in these kinds of cases, unfortunately, that is a common reaction. They, they want this to go away. They have an intimate relationship with the alleged aggressor. They don't want to break up the family. They don't want to jeopardize it. And it's it. certainly understandable. Right. I'm sure we'll see how that all plays out. There'll be much more on this story. Well, that wraps up another week of stories at the KPBS Roundtable. I'd like to thank my guests. Kelly Davis of San Diego City Beat, Tony Perry of the Los Angeles Times, and Brent Scrotenbohr of USA Today. A reminder, all of the stories we discussed today are available on our website, kpbs.org. I'm Mark Sauer. Thanks for joining us today on The Roundtable.